Hi, Vladimir. So, tell us please what happened during the last week. We have several topics we've been monitoring pretty closely. Oil refineries, Russian military, inflation. Can you share more about what important events occurred that are worth of our attention? All right, yes, hello everybody. Remember we decided last time to speak about the labor market and how possible new wave of mobilization will affect it. We'll touch on that a bit later today, but I wanted to start with gasoline because we have new data coming from Russia that indeed these attacks of Ukrainian drones on their refineries are affecting the market very notably. Compared to the end of February, the weekly production of gasoline went down by 150,000 tons to about 755,000 tons per week. So it's about 17% decline. Right, that's uh, significant indeed. The number was uh, rather hot during the week and many analysts already chimed in on that. And there are several conclusions coming out of it. Look, several successful attacks, how vulnerable the industry is, Several successful attacks already cause about a fifth of Russian oil refineries go offline. That tells that if this war against oil refineries will continue, I think it's more important not what already happened during these weeks of March, but how it will unfold further. If this effort continues, if the trend continues, then it would mean that a third or maybe 40% or maybe they can even get to 50% of getting Russian gasoline off the market. And that would imply a full-scale catastrophe for the fuel market of Russia. Because right now they're supporting themselves by prohibiting exports and there is more information coming out that they're actively importing gasoline from Belarus. They traditionally were oriented for exporting gasoline. They did not have enough uh, much Belarus market for the production to satisfy, so they were always used as export uh, refineries. So now they're using them as a buffer because they're lacking gasoline production on their own territory. So now they're taking from Belarus. But it's an interesting point here, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you see differently, but I see that in the recent days these attacks of UAVs on oil refineries have ceased. No, I cannot say that, Vladimir. This week we definitely had an attack. I think it was Samara Novokuybyshev factory, right? So there was just one, and I think it was only one attack during this last week. And for several days I have not heard any more. And I may be wrong, but there is an interesting fork here that if they leave it as is, then well and nearly Russian companies and Russian authorities will find ways to deal with it. I think it would be more interesting to see what happens after. Because we hear some rumors that Americans came over to Kyiv and asked them to not bomb Russian oil refineries. So if that situation continues, it's very curious to see how much more damage can they cause. Several attacks already caused almost a fifth of Russian market. And they can probably put it uh, to a stall if they really try. Right, I think Putin is really hoping that the United States might help somehow. But Vladimir Zelensky, by the way, recently came out in his interview and said that the United States are not pleased with the tactics of Ukraine. But he also acknowledged that, well, so what? Because Ukraine still needs to exist and needs to fight back. So probably Putin crying his tears over the United States to try to help him stop Ukraine from attacking oil refineries did not achieve his goal and it seems that they will continue destroying those uh, refinery plants. So it's curious, right? If Putin is now reaching out to Americans, you know, people uh, now quote their insider knowledge, a very popular method of presenting data. I actually do have insider in Russia uh, in many industries and they are saying that in many of these hits that were executed, the results were so serious and severe that there are no easy ways to replace damaged equipment. Those unique pieces that were damaged, they're individually made for each factory, nobody stockpiles them, and then the question comes, okay, where do you, where are you going to get one built? So at least half of these uh, damaged 
capabilities are not easy to repair. So that causes a long-term issue. And I don't know how their relation with Americans will continue, but uh, it appears Ukraine found a very effective and serious lever to attack Putin with. And we have not yet seen much changes price-wise in Russia because the elections just finished and the companies, I think, retail companies are still concerned about bringing prices for gasoline up internally. But you can see on the results of the St. Petersburg wholesale exchange, the price grew up by a good 30% since the beginning of this year on the wholesale. And it's physically impossible that they will maintain retail price at the current levels. And I already have about 15 different messages from different regions of Russia that uh, gasoline is already rising over the last few days. It came up for a ruble or two in Kostroma and Volgograd regions. But this is uh, just in some areas, not everywhere. So we're waiting for the next round of Russian stat data to come out. I think it will be sometime middle this week. But um, this uh, wholesale axe is hanging by a thread over the retail market. So we'll see how the prices will react. And, you know, it's similar to like Black Sea Fleet when Ukraine figured out how to destroy that without even getting out uh, their own vessels in water. And they found another story where they can grab Putin by the balls and uh, it definitely affects market very seriously. The next favorite topic of ours is inflation. We're going back to the favorite rubric, there are no miracles. Pre-election pause is over and the weekly and uh, daily and annual inflation is going up. I don't know where Nabilina, which microscope she used to find deflationary processes, life does not confirm. And we traditionally build a graph on the price growth for some goods. By the way, sensation, cucumbers disappeared from the top 10. They went down. Uh, they're still costing more than the beginning of the year. But now it's only by 4.5%. Remember, in February, they were like 30% over. Yeah, so Putin prevailed over the cucumbers. Indeed, he did. And uh, we're just bad-mouthing him here, right? But um, joking aside, you can really see that what we promised is coming true, that different other items start to jump here and there. The moment you put one to bed, the others uh, raise their heads. And at the beginning it was 2%, now it's 5%, 6-7%. Meat, salt, vodka, more vegetables, medical uh, supplies really going up. I did not include those in this list much, but uh, we can dedicate a separate issue to that. And by the way, um, airfare, the basic airfare went up over 10% uh, from the beginning of this year. And if you take the 360 days overall, that's over 40% growth. And people are now in Russia commenting that you cannot really fly much on our salaries. Um, so there's no deflation. Everything continues. Prices continue to grow. And I think that after this election charade, that whole train will start gaining speed. The next uh, central bank uh, rate information and meeting will be at the end of April. And I think April will be a rather inflationary month. I do not see any reasons for the price growth to slow down. Another interesting moment, we did talk about that before. It uh, makes sense to divide inflation into a general inflation. Russian stat uh, ministry provides uh, the ballpark inflation for the country. And then you can also cherry pick and dive deeper into the daily fast moving consumer goods indexes. And you can see that in three years, the price is 200% for everything you see in stores in Russia. So when people say that oh, prices seem to grow much faster than official inflation number, yeah, it's not seeming, it's real. All right, you know, 7%, 20%, 200%, who cares? It's just a change. All right, bad joke about yesterday, a guest chamber, today, guest chamber. My head hurts, stop it. Um, yeah, no deflationary processes are happening on the horizon. And um, what else? Uh, out of the new data by Russian stat, we come to the block of um, not so good news. Remember, we discussed a rapid slowdown of military production in the previous month. Right, I remember. And there was a working hypothesis that they reached their plateau. Well, I still am in favor of that hypothesis. But... Let's see that, um, so February showed very high growth rates 
in military especially, in military production, 51% in February of this year compared to February of uh, the previous year. So this first chart is about weapons and uh, munition, and the second slide is about tanks, armored vehicles, uh, jets, everything that moves, basically. So the growth there is pretty high, too. And it means that by compared to February of 22, when it was uh, so-called uh, base level of production, now they've achieved 200% growth on both of the slides, so they doubled their production, this is true. Now the question in this situation, is it a temporary blip, or indeed, did the Russian military complex return back to its growth? I think we'll see that in the next few months, and this is an important topic that deserves our attention. But my current version, my current hypothesis, is that it looks like they were just finishing and completing certain orders that were to a degree assembled over time, and this is just their final completion that they're reporting now. But they have not sped up and enhanced their production capability. Because the information I'm getting, their production lines were not doubled. So you're implying that this is just they've been building something for too long and finally they have launched it, right? They have uh, produced something that they were producing. Right, it could be a cyclical production. I, It still uh, is a hypothesis. I guess you and I will be verifying it in our further streams. But since I do know quite a bit about our military industry in Russia, I think this was just a prolonged story. Because the previous months there was not much delivered um, exactly because they delivered in February. I'm suspecting, and this may be a good scenario, when they just take a lot of time to produce certain deliverables. And that's why the previous couple months were slow, and then in February they finally delivered. Um, there is also a probable, probable scenario of uh, less favor for us, but um, we'll continue researching that. But again, I'm seeing what is happening on the ground. I know that they're working three shifts already. They're fully loaded at 100% capacity. They did not build any new factories. And they have big issues with bringing equipment and materials and supplies for the current production. So I'm still the proponent of the theory that they have big issues growing it further. But one has to acknowledge that February numbers are looking good for Putin, that growth of munitions and arms and uh, military vehicles production was impressive in February. And of course, there are a lot of questions in relation to that, because a ton of Russian production depends on the Western components. For example, Wall Street Journal wrote an article this week that all nitrocellulose that is needed to produce powder, practically 100% of that is being imported from Europe and the United States through some Turkish company. Russia is not producing enough of that nitrocellulose. Uh, China is also not producing it in big quantities. So, by the way, Europe itself and manufacturers of arms in Europe actually run into a shortage of that item and uh, it results in price growth in European market. So it's not only going to Russia, but it is also affecting prices for European manufacturers. This is horrible. Right. All these traders, damn assholes, they um, cannot not know where it goes. Right, that company came out and said, oh, we have never heard that they're using it, it's impossible to be used for powder production. Right, and the flag that Russia is buying it in such huge quantities, that's an uh, unexplainable feature, right, of reality. Exactly, and again, we're coming back to the fact that journalists are bringing it up to the light. It would be nice if finally bureaucrats sat down and did their homework too, that they could put maybe a, several dozen people who would be monitoring all manufacturers of military-sensitive components and uh, would, track, would be tracking wh what goes where. But we're still in the situation where we learn everything from newspapers. Again, we'll be bringing these topics with Europeans and Americans. They just need to set the goal for certain systems to just cut off all supplies for all military components for Putin, once and forever. And um, I think Russia maintains the deliverable rate at the current pace because they are getting the components. And uh, yeah, let's keep 
a hand on the pulse of the situation. So February was pretty bad in terms of news that Putin actually grew up his uh, military deliverables in this month. So let's compare the charts. You can see the blue line. This is a, a trend excluding seasonality, but you could see that over six months Russian manufacturing capability was pretty uh, steady and in February it starts to go up. The good part of it is that it's only due to military production. Any other manufacturing in Russia is not experiencing any growth and actually is going into decline. So it was only military numbers that changed this outlook. I will dig deeper and I'll look into the information coming from individual factories even though this data is limited, but still I'll try to aggregate those numbers and see if it is a systemic issue or not. All right, do not forget to support the stream with your like, your comment and uh, subscribe if you can because that's what helps us to promote these videos and if your subscribe button is still of our own color that means you have not subscribed so please click that uh, fix it and let us go deep into economy in the next segment we are talking about economy here and our economy as a channel also depends upon your support so if you can donate if you can support us as a project we will really appreciate you and now let's go back to our interview with Vlad um, all right let's go to mobilization and its effect on the markets. Oh yeah, in uh, this aspect there are two interesting factors affecting the labor market. First of all is mobilization that forces people to leave and hide and second is uh, now the outflow of migrants because after the terrorist activity in Krokus they, many of them are fleeing Russia. And it's an interesting story. I'm monitoring Russian Z channels and uh, of course Putin is screaming about Ukrainian trace, but it's funny to see in these channels where they say, yes, of course, Ukraine, we will avenge, but migrants. And then the rest of the article is about migrants and how uh, that system works. And official data is now reporting that Tajikistan is getting more migrants back uh, coming from Russia, returning home, than going to Russia now main reason quoted is that they are afraid for their lives and now it's interesting to see if Russian economy can even exist and maintain its uh, rate when so many human resources are leaving it. All right, let's uh, watch a small video clip to start with because I usually like to say that our top leaders, they do repeat the same mantra, they acknowledge that deficit of personnel and workforce is a serious issue for economy, and I wanted to aggregate several of these videos together, because, you know, if they acknowledge something in the open, just like Putin when uh, he came with his speech and saying that in the near years the deficit of personnel will not disappear, that means that the issue is serious. So here is a minute with uh, change from Putin and his uh, bureaucrats. Our entrepreneurs need to understand that situation for them, from the point of view of having personnel, access personnel, will not change to a better in the near future. They will be facing deficit of workforce. A serious limiting factor for the future growth of our production capability is personnel deficit. Unemployment in February fell to 2.7% with seasonal adjustment, but the uh, labor market is still experiencing trouble. According to the research, the main industries facing sh personnel shortages are ironworks, medical production and refineries and extractions. We need to lift those limitations that Denis was talking about in his foreword, the main limiting factor is personnel. Without that, it will be difficult for us to face challenges that we see today, because questions about personnel are probably the most important trend or the most important challenges. All right, so here I wanted to show very roughly the balance of workforce that can become prey for the military drafting commissions. These are rough numbers, but they allow to scale the situation at large. So in Russia we have 
overall male from 20 to 50 years old. We can probably narrow it, but generally it's about 30, 31 million people. That includes everybody. That includes those who left, those who are totally disabled and cannot be drafted. So that's the whole massive, it's about 30 million. Out of that number, about 10 million, and I did that estimation by different measures, uh, estimating different professions and different sectors of economy, gauging the level of salaries that uh, outline high qualifications. So roughly about a third of them, about 10 million, are the ones who are qualified specialists. In which capacity? That means that to prepare such a specialist, the country will need to spend time and effort. So not everybody can replace that person. One thing is a manager or a guard, another is a high qualified specialist. And to prepare such resource, uh, you need to invest time and money. You cannot just find it on the market. And the left column is roughly about a million that will be touched by that mobilization. And we have the number that Putin supposedly requested for new offensive on Kharkov or whatever, wherever else he wants to draft 300,000. In my estimation, given the experience of the autumn of 22 draft, 300,000 means that 700,000 also will leave, the country will go into hiding mode. So it's with about two, two and a half coefficient for every person drafted. So that implies about a million people leaving the labor market. And those people who will leave Russia, they will be likely people of qualified specialties because they basically have money to do that and capability to integrate outside. And that will be the way they'll protect themselves. So that million that will be touched upon by mobilization is about 10% of the total quantity that one can say are qualified specialists. This is a lot. This is why I'm thinking that Putin is not only afraid of public opinion, but this is one of the main problems why they're so delicately trying to approach this new wave of mobilization, because it will definitely affect the labor market, which is already hurting. Therefore, if you look at just uh, press articles and the research by different headhunting agencies and recruiting agencies, on all parameters, the situation is very difficult. Gaidar Institute is outlining that at least half of uh, the companies are talking about personnel deficit. Yakov and Partners is saying that it is a record ever high, 1,200,000 unclosed and still open vacancies in different companies. They're expecting that number to grow up to 3 million in the near time. And all these job sites, Avita Work, Headhunter, etc., they are doing research in different specialties and they're outlining that the deficit is horrible. The worst one so far is in logistics. It um, finds interesting reflections in regional transit and regional bus transportation, they don't have enough drivers because many of them went to the occupied territories because Putin's government is paying higher salaries for work on those territories. It may not be directly related to military, but a lot of drivers go to work and uh, accept contracts in the occupied territories. And I have enough contacts in logistic companies who are basically complaining that a third of their vehicles are dormant now because they don't have drivers. And in the same military industry, Mantarov said that 16,000 was the deficit of specialists in military production complex. Then uh, people, they're liking to enhance their production capabilities. So highly qualified specialists. Regardless of what angle you take, situation is very difficult. It already affects a half of Russian companies. They have millions of open job vacancies. And another factor that we have discussed with you is that business has a very low margin in the current condition. From all this trade through Asia, they don't get enough profit to develop and to exist. Ross Business Consulting is indicating that the capability to grow salaries are done. They have reached their maximum and there is nowhere else to take money from. 
and the job market is uh, stale in regards of offers as well. So they cannot regulate that with more money. And now the problem is not uh, just finding those 300,000 for new mobilization. The problem is that the moment they announce it, it means that more people will start looking for ways out. So whenever you say 300,000, you generally have to keep a million in mind. And that will be a serious number for the job market. And most of those who will try to leave Russia and to hide from mobilization are those people of qualified professions, those high qualified specialists where the situation is already dire, where the vacancies are abundant already. And another factor that needs attention is um, deferments and postponements. So the Minister of Defense acknowledged that they issued deferments for 830,000 people, that they are not to be drafted for this current operation. And they gave some data about which professions got those deferments, were mostly IT professions and financial market professions, financial industry. But uh, those industries that are not covered by that umbrella, it, they are hurting, they're also complaining. So my prognosis is that that pool of deferments has already increased by over a million and uh, it will continue to grow because companies will try to protect their core specialists with this method. That's why when people say, well, when Putin just clicks his fingers, they'll find those 300,000 and they will go fight. Nothing like that. This will be a colossal strike on the economy, on the job market, and with all the current metrics, it'll probably throw it into a cataclysmic situation. And it likely will kick out 10 additional percent of highly qualified experts from the system. And I don't know how, the, how it will fare, how it will survive it. That's why I think they are not too much in a hurry. They will probably try to distribute those drafting quotas through the companies. So the companies will have to find those specialists who are less needed to be sent to the front instead of announcing the overall drafting and mobilizations that will cause some panic and people fleeing the country. So you think they'll be doing it in a covert way. Exactly. Covert strategy is probably best for them right now. And you did mention that migrants are leaving the country, right? Now we'll also have the outflow of Russians themselves leaving their Russia proper. And that's a normal human reaction when you're faced with a mortal danger of being f uh, killed in some stupid war, then um, yeah, they'll be running. So Putin cannot really easily conduct this mobilization. And I think that picture is one of the main holding factor that explains why they're slow walking it because for the labor market, it will be a colossal blow. Tell me, please, from the economic point of view, how they attract people there, or at least try to, by extra payments, higher salaries, and in regions, there's always a race. They actually reached in Moscow region about a million rubles, a single time payment when you sign a contract with army, and that keeps growing. So it probably affects inflation somehow, and it's understandable they need money to do that. How big of the money are we talking about? Does it affect budget at large? No, it doesn't, Michael. Because comparatively speaking, 80% of military budget goes to manufacturing capability. So these payments, yeah, it, it looks like a lot per person, but if you multiply it, it mm, perhaps will get to hundreds of billions of rubles, and they do have that money. They have budgeted for that. So the main component in the military budget is still not salaries. Those salaries are 20% tops, roughly speaking. The rest is military production and production of military equipment and ammunitions. And this is where the hurting point is. When they run out of money, that they will stop payments for those contracts. They might have issues with manufacturing, but they will find money to make these payments to get the recruits to the front. And there was another theory that was uh, surfaced this week that that somehow affects economy in a positive fashion, these payments. Uh, this affects only a very small segment of economy. Maybe hundreds of thousands of people get that effect. So if to compare that, for example, your whole village was drafted and they got some money, and all of a sudden one village 
got money, right? And then there are dozens of other villages around. So that's how you can see it. You can actually see it in some small enclaves. You can see that uh, this money pay effect, but at large, in the scale of large economy, that doesn't affect things. This is like a drop in the ocean, and it does nothing for economic growth at large. And the fact that business expenses for salaries are growing because they have to find heads, right, that counterbalances. So that eats that money, approximately how much money they in inject into economy by these payments, and I suspect it's even less than what business has to spend in order to find personnel to resolve their problems. So my conclusion from this is that this is a colossal blow on the labor market, that second wave of mobilization. And I am thinking that all these uh, Putin's oligarchs and Chemizovs of this world, they're probably whispering to his ear, please do not do that. If you need more soldiers, let's find some compromising way to do that. And um, they will be still drafting, of course. They need uh, life force in the front. But I think the compromise would be going through quotas uh, in companies instead of announcing that big panicky overall mobilization. Oh yeah, that's exactly, I think, what they're doing. Right, I hope, Michael, I explained that picture detailed enough that you asked me last time to find more data on. What else? Deprivatization topic. Right, this is a deprivatization, perhaps not so exciting as many other aspects, but for me, it definitely poses a lot of interest. Because people were talking about cancellations of privatization results, sure, here you go. But there is a nuance, as they like to say. Right, in the freshest episode of that, and we'll have more of these episodes coming, because it apparently becomes uh, an option now that, hey, it's a fire sale, so you can cut, steal, rob, do whatever. So this week they're stealing a company, Magfa, from a governor of uh, Chelyabinsk region, Yurevich. He used to be a friend of Surkov, one of the Putin's closer circle people. And here Putin says on one of his messages that there'll be no deprivatizations. But uh, here, right after that, uh, prosecutor, federal prosecutor comes out and says, yeah, we got it for about trillion rubles worth. And we have confiscated assets for that amount from several companies. And Magfa is one of the bigger ones about it. So... They basically grabbed, I think that's what's happening, they grabbed the RBC rating 500 and they're going through that rating and checking which company is not belonging to the top level of oligarchs close to Putin. If it is some Antipa for Yurevich, we don't know these fellas, so let's go appropriate it. And that's what I think is going to happen to all the companies and the owners who are not directly related to large Putin clans. I think at the end of it, perhaps not directly, but through some intermediaries, but the end beneficiaries of this process would be exactly those big players close to Putin, who are acting through different systems now. Ordered by Chemizov, uh, something was taken away, or maybe Kiryenko ordered Rosatom and some other structures to take away other companies. But at the end, we will have an economy that is being owned by 8 to 15 number of families that are close to Putin's inner circle. And every random private owner who is not part of that system will lose his business and uh, lose his property. And I once again reviewed the meeting of Russian Chamber of Industrialists where they're whining about having a chance to go back to the paradigm of 10 years ago. And uh, what paradigm are you talking about, guys? They're revoking privatization rules from back in the mid-90s, right? We're in the field where there are no rules anymore left. So the remaining owners, I don't think they will have, I don't think their party membership in Putin's Russia will be able to buy them some safety. The vultures are out and they're hunting. And the funny part is that these industrialists that are whining, they're absolutely loyal to Putin's power. So there is no reason to suspect them in anything. It's just in a circle really needs money and they want resources. So that's what they're doing. And I will not be original here. Basically, imagine you're a businessman, right? You made some money in Russia and you're thinking, you have a dilemma, whether to export this money or to invest them somewhere and build, I don't know, a chicken factory or something that will at some point 
raise attention of uh, Dima Patrushev, the son of Patrushev. So that moment will probably just inspire more private money to flee Russia, to leave it in any fashion possible. And on the backdrop of these news, Putin's appeal in his recent speeches for investments, it just looks hypocritical. I think Vladimir now will have a bunch of uh, grifters who would uh, quickly create a company for some grant or some federal money that are being sent to, let's say, Belgorod for some repairs, get the grant, turn it into cash and leave the country, right? I think that schema will be most popular. And all these federal monies that are being dedicated to certain repairs and other maintenance will probably end up in the pockets of some grifters, just simply because you cannot do any other kind of business in Russia effectively. It uh, will be interesting to see what will happen with Alpha Group, with uh, Galitsky assets, not Magnitsky, sorry, I misspoke. Uh, unfortunately, Putin has executed Magnitsky in uh, prison a few years ago. So I'm thinking that a few years from now, the, all the big players, when they'll run out of these companies to appropriate, they will start devouring each other. And that'll be quite a bloodbath. Right, Michael, I think Alpha and the other big players in some fashion will be picked up by big oligarchs, by the Putins in a circle. So behind Magnit, there is... Uh, Lavrov and uh, his relatives. Alpha Bank is also now related to VTB, a uh, foreign export bank of Russia, which is also connected to Putin. So I think they'll find ways to some agreements. Perhaps they will avoid shooting and all the excesses of 90s, but they will definitely go through some reallocation. Well, you know, it's not really a choice, Vlad, when, you know, sell it to me or else of course right there'll be some of this uh, blackmail but i think they will give relatively okay prices to friedman and the like so they could leave their businesses for putin's really close circle and sorry about uh, my cat he's jumping around and affecting my lighting in the studio so everything will essentially be owned by several big oligarchs several big family groups that will control everything, including the very last village store somewhere deep in rural Russia. And we're moving to some sort of oligarch-managed Soviet-type economy where everything will be not transparent, very corrupt, and they will be getting government subsidies for different projects and will probably be capitalizing 70 or 80% into cash and then withdrawing it from Russia to some safe haven outside in Singapore or someplace else. And they're talking about needing investments to grow somewhere, but their behavior, they're currently expressing, this is the behavior of a mad person. You cannot, uh, this is not a climate to invest things in. Right, I think the last option they have will be just to shake everybody to get more money. Exactly, Michael, they will probably increase taxation to make sure they take money as much as they can. And the government will be taking money from people and finding ways to invest it wherever they see fit or to patch holes. So kind of going back to USSR type of financial management. As we're talking about ruble in this uh, end of March uh, week, it didn't fortify itself. So we'll be expecting for the future rate. I know some people were expecting that right after the 17th of March, the ruble will drop down immediately. No, it's not related to the 17th of March. I think it's more related to the 30th of April milestone and the rule about a mandatory sale of um, currency profits. And I know central bank is against of continuing a certain leniency for other companies so they do not have to sell. But uh, that's one of the levers they can use to prevent trouble from falling down. Oil had fortified itself a little bit last week and Brent reached $87 a barrel. I think this will likely support Putin's budget in some degree. Not super critical, but the discounts on Urals still remain. And they roughly mean that if Brent is 87, that means that Ural, Urals is going to be about $70 a barrel. And that's roughly what they have planned in the budget. So it doesn't give them any special booster. It just maintains the current status quo. And in March, perhaps they return to some sort of planned level of oil and gas incomes. And I'm awaiting till the end of next week for Ministry of Finance to release more data about the March budget. We'll continue monitoring the situation with deficit. 
and there'll be a lot of interesting things related to oil refineries, I think, with gasoline and the inflation in the next stream a week from now. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you very much. This is a very engaging story. As apparently we discovered, uh, oil prices is not exactly to our benefit right now. Um, but I do have a question always about oil, because we have a ton of different numbers floating in the world economic estimates that are not even matching each other. So tell me, please, where do we get the number, how much Russia did sell oil-wise? Do we get this number from Putin's government or from whom? Look, Michael, we get this data from how much budget received from the sales of this oil. So the number that the budget, Putin's budget received from oil sales, whom are we getting it from? From Ministry of Finance, yes. So I do have a problem with this number, Vladimir, because there was a recent article that Russian vessels fail to sell oil to Indian refineries because India doesn't want to have it anymore and they're standing there waiting for some deal or rerouting. So how much can we trust this number that Russia is publishing? Is it money that they sold it for? Is it in rupees in India that they still need to be converted? I'm asking all these questions into the air. I understand there are not many clean answers to it. Okay, let me comment, Michael. There are actually some answers to this matter. So roughly speaking, if to simplify everything, Ministry of Finance takes their money from the oil driller drilling companies on the conditions on the INCO terms FOB Novorossiysk or FOB Pacific Ocean. And then the oil companies get into the trap because they have to pay money and then they have to find ways to sell it. Right, so wait a second. The budget takes money from them and then they have to sell it after? Exactly. Minister of Finance doesn't care and the Russian tax system doesn't care whom they sell it for and how much. Exactly. So. There are two taxes in Russia. There is an export duty and there is a tax for extraction. And that's what they take from these oil companies. They levy a tax for extraction. If the papers show that you extracted so many barrels, that's how much you pay for. And then you pay for export duties. And the government doesn't give a rat's ass about where the oil goes. So the oil companies are themselves taking the brunt of issues on their shoulders and they have some amortization pillow to cushion that situation and what's important for the budget is the discount for the Urals type of oil and that's what goes into the customs declaration. Now starting this year they are setting a special discount, the maximum affordable discount, $15 from the price of Brent which in reality could be even bigger, but uh, that'll be for the oil companies to find a better deal and to optimize the situation for themselves. But once again, Ministry of Finance, all these issues with tankers, with grey fleets and all, they don't care. They take money at the extraction and they take money at the export terminal in Novorossiysk or over on the Pacific uh, side of Russia. So all these hassle about sales and uh, issues that falls on the shoulders of oil companies. So all you need to know for the Russian income is literally take a look at the Ministry of Finance. Their number is actually pretty accurate. They will always take what is theirs, what they think is due from the oil companies. Right, but then the risk is that oil companies at some point will run out of money, right? Yeah, that is the risk if the situation will become difficult. But in the current structure of oil prices, and we can discuss later, maybe next time, what's happening with them, but at the current oil price levels, everybody has enough. The wolves are fed and the sheep are safe. When euros are 70 and Brent is 87. That means the budget gets enough and the oil companies do get enough money to cover their expenses. So for them, it's generally comfortable zone. We can discuss more of that situation next time, what's happening and what their trends, uh, current trends in the oil market. All right, thank you so much for your detailed review. Vladimir, see you next week. Goodbye.